Let's continue with whatever we were doing. So you know, let me uh, let me recall a few things. So you see, we started by asking what the image of uh, an analytic mapping is, okay? And uh, of course, uh, uh, the if you, you we've, we've already seen that you know because of the open mapping theorem, the image of uh, a non-constant holomorphic map is an open set, and in fact, it is an open mapping. So it takes open sets to open sets. So the image of a domain is again a domain. Okay. And then uh, I told you that uh, we wanted to know what, uh, we, want to know, we wanted to know more about the, uh, the, the image set, okay. we, namely the set of values that the analytic function takes. And uh, you know, uh, somehow uh, the, the open mapping theorem tells you that for example, you cannot expect the image of a non-constant holomorphic map to, be, to lie inside a curve for example, okay. because there is uh, it does not have the property that it can accommodate a sufficiently uh, small disk. Okay. So, um, then of course, um, uh, we were, uh, we, we stated the so called uh, uh, little Picard theorem or the small Picard theorem which says, which deals with the case of uh, uh, an analytic function which is, which is analytic on the whole complex plane, the so called entire function. And the theorem says that uh, uh, the image will be either the whole plane or it will be the plane minus a single point. Okay, and interestingly, the proof of this uh, theorem, which is usually stated only stated in a first course in complex analysis, uh, uh, involves interesting amount of analysis, and that's what we'll try to uh, do as part of our uh, this series of lectures. And I told you the the key to this proving this uh, little Picard theorem is the so-called big Picard theorem or great Picard theorem which has got to do with the image of uh, a deleted neighborhood of an isolated essential singularity uh, under an analytic mapping. Okay. And the great Picard theorem, what does it say? It says uh, the conclusion of the great Picard theorem amazingly is the same as that of the little Picard theorem. It says that uh, you, take a, you take a deleted neighborhood uh, uh, of uh, an isolated essential singularity of an analytic function. Uh, then the image of that under uh, the analytic function will be again the whole plane or it may be the plane minus uh, at the worst one point or one value that is missed. Okay? So it is either the plane or it is the punctured plane and uh, uh, I told you that the proof of the little Picard theorem that we will uh, give is going to be a, uh, as a corollary of the big Picard theorem and uh, to study the proof of the big Picard theorem or the great Picard theorem, we will need to study what are about meromorphic functions. Okay? And these are functions, essentially these are functions which are, these are analytic functions which have uh, the only singularities as poles. Okay? And so this led us to understand the, uh, and, and recall, rather recall the uh, notion of singularity. So I told you that singularities of analytic functions are of two types, uh, namely the, uh, the isolated and the non-isolated ones. Okay? And uh, uh, of course, a non uh, classic example of a non isolated singularity is are the points on the negative real axis which have to be cut out if you want, a, uh, for example, to define an analytic branch of the logarithm of uh, log z, logarithm of z, okay, z being a complex variable. And I told you that uh, uh, these non isolated singularities require uh, uh, much uh, deeper techniques, for example, the study of Riemann surfaces uh, to deal with them. Uh, but then we are going to be worried only about uh, 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 isolated singularities and I told you the isolated singularities come in three uh, categories or groups and uh, these are mutually exclusive. The first uh, kind of uh, uh, isolated singularity is called uh, removable because uh, the idea is that the, sing the singularity can be removed 
in the sense that you can redefine the function so that it becomes analytic at that point and so it is not really a singularity. Uh, then, um, then there are the poles uh, which are thought of as zeros of the denominator okay and uh, uh, of course if the function does not have a denominator it is not writable as a numerator by a denominator uh, then uh, poles are just zeros of the reciprocal of the function okay and I told you that uh, uh, a function has a, a pole of a certain order if and only if the reciprocal function has a zero of the same order. Uh, at that given point uh, and then what we are left with is are the uh, singularities which are neither removable nor poles and uh, uh, they are cleverly called as essential singularities and uh, uh, and they are very very important uh, as, as the for example the great Picard theorem tells you. Now uh, what I am going to do is uh, first uh, prove a certain uh, weaker form of the great Picard theorem the so called casualty Weierstrass theorem which says that you know uh, uh, if you take an isolated essential singularity then you take uh, a small neighborhood of that deleted neighborhood of that no matter how small the image of that will be dense in the whole complex plane namely uh, uh, it will uh, you can always find uh, uh, a sequence of complex numbers uh, in any neighborhood such that the values approach any given complex value okay and that is a very deep uh, uh, that is already a very deep result but it can be uh, you know deduced from the Riemann theorem on removable singularities. So what I am going to do is now I am going to uh, uh, tell you something about the Riemann theorem on removable singularities because it involves uh, a lot of uh, nice concepts okay. Uh, so here is Riemann's theorem, uh, theorem on removable singularities. and it is a uh, it is a it is a very very deep theorem because you know uh, it already uses uh, some of the most basic theorems in complex analysis in its proof okay. So uh, we will see that so uh, so let me let me state that uh, uh, let uh, z0 be uh, an isolated singularity uh, singularity of uh, the analytic function oops, uh, the analytic function f of z uh, then uh, the following conditions are equivalent so uh, number one uh, is it not is a removable singularity uh, that is the first condition uh, and uh, so here uh, you can give several definitions of removable singularity but we will give the most natural one. The most natural definition for removable singularity is that it can be removed namely that you can uh, the analytic function can extend to, ana to an analytic function even at the point of singularity okay. What it means is that you can find uh, an analytic function uh, which is also defined at the singular point and which equals the given analytic function outside that point okay that is what that is what it means to say that the analytic function extends to an analytic function also at the singular point. So that means you have by extending it you have actually been able to remove the singularity alright. So of course you know the standard example you should think of is sin z by z at z equal to 0 uh, you can uh, you know the limit at, uh, at z equal to 0 is 1. So you know you can uh, you can take the function that takes the value sin z by z uh, at z not equal to 0 and at z equal to 0 you can define it to be 1 and then this turns out to be an analytic extension okay. So, so let me write that down uh, uh, that is uh, there exists an analytic function uh, function um, uh, so uh, 
uh, g of z uh, analytic at z naught such that g of z is the same as f of z uh, for z not equal to z not in a small neighborhood of z not. So, this is what it means uh, to say that the singularity is removable. I am able to extend the analytic function uh, to the point to the singular point. And to be able to extend the analytic function to the singular point means that I am able to find another I am able to find an analytic function which is also analytic at the singular point and restricts to the given function outside that point ok. So, let me rewrite it uh, it is it is very important uh, in mathematics to be able to say things in different ways uh, verbally ok without using uh, symbols or notations as far as possible because that will help you to get a good understanding of the ideas ok. So, you should be able to uh, state theorems at least uh, uh, um, as accurately as possible without using much notation and just using concepts ok. This is something that you should strive to do. Uh, you may be able to write technical mathematics uh, 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 namely you can write a theorem uh, with all the technical symbols and so on, but then it is very very important for the purpose of communication and understanding that you should also be able to say things in a way that does not involve any notation ok. And uh, so, in that sense uh, uh, to uh, when you say something is a removable singularity uh, a point is a removable singularity what it means is that the analytic function extends to an analytic function at the singular point ok. So, uh, uh, so let me write that down in other words uh, f extends to the to an to an analytic function g at z dot ok. So, uh, this is the um, I mean so this is actually the definition of what a removable singularity is ok. So, this is the first uh, this is the first condition ok. So, you can see that what this theorem does is that it gives you various uh, equivalent conditions for a singularity to be removable. So, uh, so what is the second condition? So, you see uh, in all these in all theorems connected with characterization of singularities there are usually at least three statements. Uh, one is about the one is essentially the definition of that singularity. The second one is uh, the behavior of the limit of uh, the function as you approach the singularity ok. And the third one is the behavior of the Laurent series around that singularity ok. So, for example, if you take the case of poles which I stated in the last lecture uh, you see uh, I, I stated that theorem in the last lecture and I wanted you to try to prove it and uh, uh, I do not know if you have done this exercise or not, but essentially you see if you try to do that exercise at some point you might have to use Riemann's removable singularity theorem which I am going to actually prove now ok. So, uh, 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 but nevertheless uh, the purpose of the exercise was to make you realize that you need to you might need to use this ok. So, you know in the case of a pole uh, the condition for uh, the first condition for a pole was that it is a pole namely which is the basic definition of a pole which is just that the it is a 0 of the reciprocal ok. The, the point is a 0 of the function which is the reciprocal of the given function ok. That is the first condition. The second condition is the behavior of the limit of the function as you approach the pole and that condition turned out to be that the limit the, the limit of the function uh, turned out to be infinity ok and uh, that is to be interpreted as the the limit of the modulus of the function uh, goes to plus infinity ok as you approach the singularity right. That is another characterization of a pole and what is the third condition? The third condition involves the Laurent expansion and uh, what was the condition based on the Laurent expansion? The condition based on the Laurent expansion was that the Laurent expansion contained only finitely many negative powers of uh, z minus z naught ok. So, you know a Taylor expansion is something that contains only positive powers and 0 powers and this of course, the 0 power corresponds to the constant term ok. And the Laurent expansion is something that will also contain negative powers uh, of z minus z naught ok, where z naught is the singular point. And if you have a Laurent expansion which has only finitely many negative terms uh, I mean terms with negative powers of z minus z naught that is an indication that uh, z naught is a pole 
okay. Now that these three conditions are equivalent was the theorem I stated last time. Uh, so in the in the same way for removable singularities uh, the first condition I have stated is uh, what a removable singularity is essentially and I will give you two more the, the two other conditions. So the second condition is going to be a condition that is got to do with the limit of the function. So the second condition says that the limit of the function exists as you approach the singularity okay just the existence of the limit uh, is the second condition okay and why it is why it is significant is because if the limit exists what you are saying is that the function extends to a continuous function at that point okay. So uh, mind you it is it is certainly weaker than the first condition because the first condition namely the definition of removable singularity is that it extends to an analytic function at that point whereas the second condition is the condition on the limit that the limit exists at that point only tells you that it extends to only a continuous function at that point okay. So uh, it is now so what you are saying is that the fact that you can continuously extend the function to the point already makes it analytic at that point okay. this is a characteristic of uh, removable singularity okay. So let me write the second condition so here is the second condition uh, uh, the, the, the limit uh, of f of z uh, as uh, z tends to z0 exists this is the condition okay. So uh, in other words in other words uh, uh, f of z extends to a continuous function at z0 namely we simply define f of z0 to be the limit at as z tends to z0 of f of z okay you define you redefine f at z0 and the resulting function becomes also continuous at z0 but what you do not have immediately is that it is also analytic at z0 okay and that is a serious that is the serious consequence that is the that is the Riemann singularity removable singularity theorem okay. Just continuity uh, just continuity at that point is good enough for analyticity okay that is the crux of the Riemann removable singularities theorem. So this is the second condition. Uh, and here is the third condition so I told you the third condition is something that is got to do with uh, uh, the, the Laurent expansion and uh, uh, you know that uh, so I, I want to give you some background on this uh, you know if you have a function which is analytic at a point then you have a so called Taylor expansion at that point okay. Uh, if the point is z0 then you have a power series in z minus z0 which involves 0 and positive powers of z minus z0 with some coefficients. And of course these coefficients are you know uh, they are just uh, the related to the nth derivatives the derivatives of the function at z0 okay. And uh, uh, so this is the Taylor this is the Taylor's theorem that you can have a Taylor expansion for the function uh, at a point z0 where it is analytic. And an extension of the Taylor's theorem is the Laurent theorem it is an amazing extension because it deals with the case when z0 is not a point of analyticity but it is a point it is an isolated singularity. What Laurent's uh, theorem says is that you can uh, still get a series but now this time you will also have to allow negative powers of z minus z0 that is the Laurent series okay and uh, Laurent's theorem says that you can get that series and the coefficients are again given by integrals okay. The see in the case of Taylor series the coefficients are given by integrals and these integrals are essentially connected to the derivatives by the general Cauchy integral formulas okay and in the Laurent expansion the coefficients of the negative terms the coefficients are all anyway given by the uh, integrals okay there, are, there is no question of derivatives at the point z0 because at z0 is not a uh, point where the function is analytic. So the coefficients of Laurent series are given in terms of integrals okay. Now so you see the Taylor series is a very special case it is a special case of a Laurent series okay and the fact that uh, uh, so, so this is the point if you have a if you have an analytic function at a point okay if you try to write the Taylor series at the point 
you will get the same result as if you try to write a Lorho series at that point. Okay. See the fact is that if you have an analytic function, uh, we know that it is given by a Taylor expansion at that point. But if you throw that point away, okay, then you get a deleted neighborhood of the point and in a deleted neighborhood of a point you always have a Lorho expansion for any function regardless of whether the function is analytic at that point or not. Okay. And the point is that if you write out the Lorho expansion for an analytic function at a point, okay, you will get only the Taylor expansion. You will not get the negative terms in the Lorho expansion. The, ne the, the negative terms in the Lorho expansion constitute what is called the singular part or the principal part of the expansion. Okay. And the principal part will not exist. That is a sign of the fact that the function that you are actually expanding into a Lorentz series is actually analytic at that point. Okay. So that is the third condition. There is a third condition in terms of Lorentz series for a removable singularity is that when you write the Lorentz series for the function uh, at the removable singularity, centered at the removable singularity, you will see that the negative uh, terms, the, the principal part does not exist, it is 0. Okay. So that is the third condition which is based on the Lorentz expansion. So here is the third condition, the, the Lorentz expansion. Uh, of f of z at z naught has no negative powers of z minus z naught. That is, uh, it has zero uh, principal part, principal or or singular part. Okay. This is the condition in terms of the Lorentz expansion and then so these are the three conditions that you will always have as equivalent in any uh, 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 theorem on singularities, characterization of singularities. Now there is one more condition which is pretty interesting and uh, it is a rather remarkable condition. The fourth condition is the following, it is the following, uh, if you have a removable singularity okay, at a point you uh, you see uh, 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 the let us believe that it is a removable singularity just to understand this condition then it becomes analytic at that point okay and if it is analytic at that point it is also continuous at that point okay and you know a continuous function on a bounded set okay uh, if you take a continuous function on a uh, closed and bounded set. Uh, it is going to be bounded in modulus okay. because uh, uh, if you take a closed and bounded set it is compact okay. and if you take a real valued continuous function on a compact set the image is going to be uh, also a compact set. Topologically the continuous image of a compact set is a compact set and a compact subset of uh, the real line is going to be bounded. Okay. So uh, the point is that uh, if you really believe that z naught is an essential singular is a, is a, is a, is a removable singularity for the function uh, it should the function should extend uh, to an analytic function at that point in any case it is going to extend to a continuous function at that point for example that is what condition 2 says then in a neighborhood of that point the function should be bounded in modulus of course see whenever we say bounded for a complex uh, valued function we mean we mean bounded in modulus okay that goes without saying okay. Uh, so that is the next condition, so it is an amazing condition, you just assume that there is a small deleted neighborhood of the point z0 where your function uh, uh, in modulus is bounded by a positive constant, okay. that is also uh, as strong as saying that it can analytically extend to that point, that is the, that is the really amazing uh, uh, hypothesis because it is a very weak hypothesis, you see the first hypothesis the first condition is that the function is the uh, it has a removable singularity namely uh, which by our definition is that the function extends to an analytic function at that point. Okay. The second condition is slightly weaker it says that it does not extend to an analytic function at that point but it extends to a continuous function at that point okay. that is a slightly weaker condition. And of course the third condition has got to do with the Laurent series which says that essentially the Laurent series is a Taylor series but the condition I am going to state now it is a very weak condition it just says that in it there is a deleted neighborhood of uh, the singular singular point where the function is bounded in modulus you see the boundedness is a very weak condition okay 
but that is strong enough to make it analytic at the point. So that is the amazing uh, power of the Riemann removable singularity theorem. Okay. So let me write that down. Uh, uh, F is bounded, and of course bounded means in modulus in a uh, deleted neighborhood. So I am using NBD for neighborhood as an abbreviation uh, of of Z naught. So, so this is the uh, this is the fourth condition, which is uh, by far the weakest condition uh, on a removable singularity. Okay. So, uh, so you know, uh, uh, why it is weak? If you want, in a, uh, if I might say a little uh, loosely, is that you know, continuous function is always bounded, but there are bounded functions there which could be very highly discontinuous. So the moral of the story is that boundedness giving rise to continuity is already something that is very hard to expect, you should not expect that and in this case boundedness is giving me analyticity. So you can imagine analyticity is a terrific condition because you know analyticity at a point means that you know not only that it is differentiable in the neighborhood of the point including that point but it is also infinitely differentiable there. So it is a terrific condition okay. that you are able to get this from boundedness is an amazing thing that is what you should appreciate okay. So alright so now what I, what I am going to do is I am going to uh, you know uh, uh, prove uh, that these uh, these various conditions are equivalent okay and uh, in the process uh, uh, help you revise some basic complex analysis okay. Um, fine so uh, so let us so let us look at these uh, uh, these conditions uh, so you know uh, let us look at uh, condition uh, 1 and 2. Uh, you see it is very clear that 1 implies 2 okay if 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 the if the uh, if the analytic function extends to an analytic function at that point then certainly uh, it extends to a continuous function at that point because an analytic function is continuous okay differentiability implies continuity so 1 implies 2 is uh, is very trivial all right and uh, 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 now uh, so, so you can see. Uh, so, I'm just trying to see uh, which of these are very easy to deduce. Uh, which, which of the equivalences are easy to deduce? So, one implies two is pretty easy. Okay, and uh, well, uh, and I think uh, 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 if you look at uh, uh, two and three, two and three are equivalent. Okay, two and three are equivalent. Uh, that's very easy to see because you know. Uh, uh, you take the uh, so 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 let me uh, so let me first tell you in words. Uh, suppose you assume two. Suppose the limit of the function at as z tends to z not exists. Okay, then I can take the limit of uh, limit as z tends to z not in the Laurent expansion. And as limit z tends to z not in the Laurent expansion exists means that cannot be any negative powers of z minus z not in the Laurent expansion because if you have a negative power of z minus z not in the Laurent expansion, it will be a term of the form a n by z minus z naught power n and that as z tends to z naught will go to infinity okay and you cannot get a finite limit. So the moral of the story is that uh, 2 implies 3 uh, is, is obvious and 3 implies 2 is also obvious because uh, you know if the Laurent expansion uh, does not have any negative terms then I can take limit as z tends to z naught in the Laurent expansion and uh, essentially what I will get is the constant term okay as I if I take limit z tends to z naught I am just setting z minus z naught equal to 0 z equal to z naught and then uh, since it is already a power series in z minus z naught if I put z equal to z naught I will get the constant term and that will be the limit okay. Now uh, so 2 and 3 are uh, clearly equivalent alright. Now there is only one technical point which I want you to notice because this is an advanced uh, this is a course in advanced complex analysis the technical point is that uh, you know uh, how can you take a limit uh, in the Laurent series okay how can you take limit z to z naught z tends to z naught of a Laurent series see uh, so basically the we are arguing in the following way uh, we are arguing as if we can take the, the, taking the limit as z to z naught z tends to z naught in the Laurent series is the same as taking the limit in each term and then summing it up okay that is what that is the way we are arguing okay and why is that correct that is because the the fact is because the because of the fact that you know 
the uh, you see the Laurent series as it is, you know, that is uh, the its convergence is uniform, okay. And uh, whenever uh, the convergence is uniform, okay, you can take a limit, okay. And uh, uh, so that is used, okay. Uh, you can take a term wise, uh, you, you, you take a series or you take a functional series, okay, and you take limit z tends to z0 of the functional series, okay. That is the same as taking limit z tends to z0 of each of the terms of the functional series and then taking the limit of the resulting numerical series. This is allowed provided the functional series converges uniformly and basically I am just using the fact that if you have a, a convergent a uniformly convergent series of uh, continuous functions then the limit is also continuous okay that is all I am using. So that is a little bit of technicality that is used when you want to prove 2 and 3 are equivalent okay and uh, and, and of course uh, 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 you know 1, 2 and 3 all the 3 uh, will uh, imply 4 because you know continuous function is bounded, continuous function on a compact set is bounded. So, uh, so the, the, the difficult part is to go from 4 to 1 okay, 4 is the weakest condition, the condition 4 is the weakest condition, it is the condition that says that you just tell me that near z0, near that singularity the function is bounded and lo behold it becomes analytic at z0 that is the that is the most tremendous uh, observation okay. So 4 implies uh, 1 is the uh, is the uh, most difficult uh, part that is the crux of the theorem okay which we will try to prove and um, and essentially uh, uh, one can uh, one will again essentially use Laurent expansions okay. Uh, so, so let me write uh, let me write down all this so uh, clearly uh, uh, 1 uh, implies 2 uh, uh, which is equivalent to 3 and uh, uh, they all imply 4 okay. So this is what we have seen the, the non-trivial part is 4 implies 1 okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you know if you want uh, 1 implies 2 basically uses uh, analytic implies continuous. Uh, uh, analytic implies continuous okay and uh, 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 2 implies uh, 3 is going to use uh, 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 well uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous okay and uh, of course uh, 1, 2 and 3 uh, imply 4 uh, all these uh, 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 all these uh, uh, they basically use the fact that the continuous function on a compact set is bounded okay. Uh, continuous function on a compact set is bounded okay. So, uh, so the, the non-trivial the, the non-trivial uh, thing to prove is 4 implies 1 namely that boundedness in a neighbourhood of the point gives you analyticity at that point which is an amazing thing okay, which is and, and interestingly the way you prove it is again using Laurent expansions okay you, you just use the Laurent expansion. So, uh, uh, so here is a so here is the proof. Uh, recall uh, that. Uh, uh, so so let me let me go to a different color. Uh, uh, recall that the Laurent expansion. of f and z0 is f of z is equal to sigma uh, n equal to minus infinity to infinity a n z minus z0 to the power of n where a n is 1 by 2 pi i integral over gamma f uh, 
w d w by w minus is a naught to the power of n plus 1. This is a Lorentz expansion okay and where gamma is a simple closed contour which goes once around uh, the point the singular point z naught in the anticlockwise or positive sense okay <coughs> we can we can very well take gamma to be a, a circle centered at z naught sufficiently small radius okay. So um, now the point is that the 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 the, the point is uh, uh, to uh, you know uh, let let me explain the idea of the proof. See what are you trying to show? You are trying to show that the function is analytic. One way to show that the function is analytic is that uh, uh, its Lorentz series is actually a Taylor series because you know a Taylor series always represents an analytic function okay a, a convergent power series within its disk of convergence always represents an analytic function okay. So uh, incidentally that is also uh, uh, that is also probably used in one of the uh, earlier equivalences okay. Uh, that is something that you have to remember if you have a convergent power series okay then uh, it can any any power series uh, uh, converges in a disc okay uh, the disc could have possibly infinite radius in which case it is the whole plane as it happens in the case of a polynomial or an exponential function uh, and in that disc the, the convergence of the power series is always uh, uh, normal namely it is uniform on compact subsets okay and it is also absolute okay. So, uh, this is something that you should have come across in a first course in complex analysis where essentially you make use of the Weierstrass m test okay. So and a convergent power series by uh, Abel's theorem uh, is that it, it can be differentiated term by term and what you get is again a power series with the same radius of convergence and uh, that is a derivative of the original power series and this is one way of showing that the derivative of a power series exists and it is gotten by differentiating it term by term the term by term differentiation is justified because of the uniform convergence okay and uh, if you apply this ad infinitum what you get is that the power series is infinitely differentiable so it is actually analytic and it is infinitely differentiable. So a power series whenever you are looking at a power series uh, uh, inside its disk of convergence you are actually looking at an analytic function and uh, what has the analytic function to which it converges got to do with the power series this power series is nothing but the Taylor expansion of that limit that limiting function. So you, you start with the power series it converges within its disk of convergence to a certain function that function is an analytic function and if you expand it as a Taylor expansion at that point you will get back the power series. So the moral of the story is that whenever you are looking at a convergent power series you are actually looking at the Taylor series of an analytic function okay and what is that analytic function it is exactly the function to which this power series converges okay. So, uh, so uh, what we are trying to show is that we are trying to show that uh, this point z0 is a basically a point where the function is analytic. So what do you expect is that you expect the Laurent series should actually be a Taylor series that means all the coefficients of the negative powers of z minus z0 in the Laurent expansion should be 0. So you try to show that all those coefficients are 0 then you are done okay and how do you show those coefficients are 0 the coefficients are given by integrals and integrals can always be estimated by the so called ml inequality okay. So this so, so what we will do is we will show that all the negative coefficients in the Laurent expansion they are all 0 and we are done okay that is exactly what I am going to do. So uh, so what is a n? a n is uh, 1 by 2 pi i integral over gamma f w d w by w minus z0 to the power of n plus 1. <coughs> where you know the picture is like this you have z0 and you have gamma uh, a simple closed curve going around z0 uh, sufficiently close to z0 going around once okay. Now you, you take for take uh, gamma uh, to be the circle okay you could the shape of gamma really does not matter because of course it is theorem actually uh, take gamma to be the circle mod z minus z0 is equal to epsilon for uh, epsilon uh, uh, positive uh, small enough small enough so that uh, this circle uh, on the circle and inside the circle except at the points that not the function is analytic okay and uh, well you know then you can uh, 
so so the the uh, the the equation z mod z minus z not is equal to epsilon uh, you can use that write it as a parametric equation and do an integration okay so uh, this is the same as writing it as z mod z is equal to z not plus epsilon e to the i theta where theta varies from 0 to 2 pi okay <coughs> and uh, so this integral becomes um, so this integral uh, so if I if I calculate the modulus of uh, an mind you I am trying to show that the modulus of an is 0 I am trying to show that the ans are 0 for negative n this formula is valid for all values of n okay uh, I am trying to show an is 0 for all negative n uh, that is that will that is good enough to say that the Laurent series is the Taylor series and that will tell me that the function is actually analytic at the point okay. So uh, I have to calculate mod a n mod a n is going to be modulus of this integral okay and then you would have come across this estimation uh, formula in a first course in complex analysis uh, which is uh, used uh, all the time uh, which says that the modulus of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the modulus. So this is less than or equal to integral over gamma of uh, if I take the modulus I am going to get 1 by 2 pi uh, mod f w uh, mod d w by mod w minus z naught to the power of n plus 1 okay and uh, uh, this integral becomes therefore just integral 0 to 2 pi because now I changed the variable of integration uh, from w to theta mind you uh, uh, you should always remember that when, whenever you write an integral then the then you have an integrand and you have a variable of integration okay and the integrand is a function of the variable of integration and the variable of integration should always vary on the area uh, uh, on the on the region of integration okay in this case the region of integration is the is the curve gamma which we have taken to be a circle so your w is actually varying on the circle okay so w should be written as z0 plus epsilon e power i theta okay so uh, uh, so the so what i'll get is uh, i i let me put this mod f uh, uh, z0 plus e to the i theta uh, uh, and then i'll have to write out uh, so i should change this uh, uh, z to w so it will become w equal to z0 plus e epsilon e to the i theta d w will be uh, i epsilon e to the i theta d theta and if I take mod d w I am going to get uh, epsilon uh, d theta okay and then I am going to get uh, here I am going to get uh, 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 epsilon mod w minus z naught is epsilon e to the i theta its modulus is epsilon so I will get epsilon to the n plus 1 okay so this is what I am going to get right and um, you know what I am going to do next you see uh, what have I assumed I have assumed condition 4 condition 4 is that the function is bounded in <coughs> modulus uh, in a sufficiently small neighborhood so you know this term uh, mod f of z0 plus e per i theta I am going to uh, remove that and put an m because mod of f z is going to be less than or equal to m in a sufficiently small uh, disk and I am assuming that epsilon is small enough so that this circle lies in that disk in that deleted uh, neighborhood of, of z0 okay. So uh, what I am going to do the next step is I am going to get rid of this mod f z0 plus e to the i theta I am going to pull that out and uh, instead of that I am going to put an m I am going to get it uh, I am going to get a, oh I forgot a 2 pi there is a there is a 1 by 2 pi outside uh, uh, and then uh, uh, so you know uh, what I will get is I will get basically I will get m uh, times uh, epsilon times 2 pi divided by uh, 2 pi times epsilon m plus 1 okay mind you when I integrate 0 to 2 pi d theta I am going to get 2 pi okay and that 2 pi is going to cancel with the 2 pi outside. So basically what I am going to get is I will get uh, mod a n is less than or equal to m times uh, uh, m by epsilon power n this is all this is all I am going to get uh, assuming uh, that by 4 uh, uh, mod f z is less than m for all z close to 
z naught uh, where uh, we assume also gamma lies okay so i'm going to get this now watch see uh, epsilon is a small quantity okay uh, epsilon can be made as small as i want i can make epsilon smaller i, I can make epsilon tend to zero okay now if n is uh, negative if n is negative mind you i am trying to show that the ans for n negative are zero i am trying to show that all the negative terms in the Laurent expansion do not exist okay. So all the negative Laurent coefficient, coefficients are all 0 I am trying to show. So if n is negative that is the case I have to look at then this epsilon power n will go to the numerator. So I will get a small quantity to a positive power okay and if I now let the small quantity go to 0 okay it is positive power will go faster to 0. So the numerator will go to 0 and since this is valid for all epsilon greater than 0 mod an has to be less than or equal to 0 and that will force mod an is 0 and that will force that an is 0 okay and we are done okay and that 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 is the end of the proof okay. So let me write that down uh, uh, now uh, if uh, n is negative uh, then uh, uh, eps, uh, epsilon power n tends to 0 as epsilon tends to 0 uh, and uh, and so mod a n equal to 0 implies a n equal to 0 okay. So this implies that uh, the principal part in the in the uh, Laurent expansion is 0 that is uh, what we have actually proved is that we have proved that uh, you know uh, 4 implies uh, 3 in fact you have actually proved 4 implies 3 and uh, uh, and and so so 4 implies 3 all right and of course 3 uh, uh, mind you is equivalent to 1 is equivalent to <coughs> 3 implies 1 because if the Taylor say if if the Laurent expansion is a Taylor expansion okay namely if it has no principal part then it is a power series so it will converge to a function and that function is going to be equal to the given function outside that point and therefore uh, what happens is that you have extended that function analytically to that point also okay. So uh, so let me write that down there is a there is a there is a little bit of uh, 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 there is there is a little bit of technicality so let me write this down uh, 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 we we uh, observe that uh, 3 implies actually 1 for if 3 holds uh, we have uh, sigma n equal to 0 to infinity a n z minus z naught power n uh, converges to g of z and uh, uh, I converge to converges to g of z in uh, mod z minus z naught uh, lesser than epsilon and uh, g is equal to f for uh, z naught equal to z naught okay so uh, see uh, so let me repeat this see if you assume 3 what does 3 say it says that f of z has a certain Laurent expansion in which there are no negative terms it f of z what does it mean it means that you have first of all a Laurent expansion which converges to a function that function to which it converges is none other than f of z okay and this is valid whenever z is not equal to z naught but what is the Laurent expansion that converges to f of z? It is actually a Taylor expansion. But you know, it, uh, namely, it's just a uh, it's just a convergent power series, and you know the convergent power series is actually Taylor expansion of the analytic function to which it converges. So there, so you take only the uh, uh, Laurent expansion which has zero principal part, it'll converge to an analytic function. Call that function as g of z, 
Now that function is going to coincide with f outside z0 by definition because you already know that the Laurent expansion also converges to f outside z0. So in principle what has happened is you have found a, uh, an analytic function g of z which is analytic at z0 and outside z0 it coincides with f okay. So, uh, so finally this proves 4 implies 1 alright and that completes the proof of the Riemann removal singularity theorem. So that is the end of the proof which I will signify by putting a uh, uh, yeah, uh, usually in books you see that people put a shaded uh, square I will put something like this to uh, indicate end of proof okay but there is uh, but there is a remark that I want to make. So uh, the remark is to fix some loose ends in the statement of the theorem uh, uh, in the so I am going back to the to the first condition okay the first condition namely the definition of a removable singularity uh, uh, what is the condition the condition is that the singularity is removable namely that there is a uh, there is a continuous function uh, uh, there is an analytic function to which this function converges. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, you see the condition only says that the function converges to an analytic function at that point but it does not say that this analytic function is unique okay. So uh, uh, the, 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 the first condition which is just the definition our definition of a removable singularity is that your function can be extended to an analytic function at that point okay but I say it can be extended to an analytic function I am not saying it can be extended to a unique analytic function and the fact is that it can be extended to a unique analytic function and the reason is the, that there is a deeper theorem behind this suppose it extends to two analytic functions at that point okay then you use the identity theorem which you should have studied in a first course in complex analysis which says that if two analytic functions coincide on uh, an open set non empty open set or for example even if they coincide on a sequence of points which has a limit point at which both of them are uh, analytic then they have to be identically equal. So that identity theorem will tell you that the if uh, uh, the singularity is removable then the function to which the analytic function to which the given function extends at the singular point is actually a unique function okay. So there is the identity theorem there okay that you should remember okay so I will stop with that.